Hello everyone, my name is Salvatore Di Costanzo. I'm an elder law and estate planning attorney in Rye in Yorktown Heights, New York. And it's good to be back with you today. Uh, we're doing this every two weeks. Uh, these are informational chat sessions, if you would. And uh, we've got some really great topics that we've been speaking about. So I hope everybody's enjoying the summer. Uh, the few weeks that are left, uh, hopefully you can find something to do that's enjoyable. And uh, uh, hopefully the fall is, is, is better than, than the, the, the spring and the beginning portions of the summer. And everybody's safe, happy, and healthy. So if you joined us last week, we spoke about the changes in the Medicaid laws. Uh, you can see my video on my website, uh, but we discussed uh, how the, the, there's a new look back period starting October 1st uh, for home care services. And just as a quick refresher, uh, prior to October 1st, in other words, currently the current state of affairs that we're in right now, there is no look back period for home care. So uh, traditionally we've been able to move assets around uh, and render people eligible for Medicaid benefits uh, very easily. Uh, quite frankly, with very little planning in advance. Uh, that's all going to change now on October 1st. Uh, starting October 1st, there's now going to be a two and a half year look back period. And this is going to be tremendously impactful for, for many families, especially families that have done no planning in advance. Uh, and so we need to talk about transferring assets and trying to do things to protect your assets, uh, and in some cases before October 1st. Uh, and I want to be clear, October 1st doesn't mean that if you get sick after October 1st that you're going to be in trouble. Uh, for instance, if you have a spouse, you can transfer your assets to your spouse. There's no look back period for transfers to a spouse. Uh, so that can happen at any time after the look back period. Uh, this really impacts people that are, let's say, um, uh, unmarried um, and generally speaking might need care in the near future. And so that's really what I'm going to focus on today. And I'm going to talk about a particular planning technique, namely the Medicaid trust that we use on a regular basis, uh, not only for today, but on a regular basis. Uh, and so you want to be careful if you know somebody in your family or maybe you have a friend uh, that might need home care in the near future. So maybe they're deteriorating, uh, they're at home, maybe there's no care in place just yet. Uh, maybe they have a little bit of care at home, but you know that their, their functional limitations are, are, are decreasing such that within a short period of time, they may need care at home. You want to pay attention to this because that's where you need to beat the October 1st deadline, if you would. So when, I, when I've been doing my, my advertising, if you would, I've been saying you have a short period of time left to transfer your assets. This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody that doesn't have an exempt method of transferring assets, such as a spouse or, or a caretaker child or a disabled child, whatever the case may be. That's another lecture for another day. But we're talking about somebody that might be unmarried. Let's say it's your mom, your dad, your grandparents. They're at home. You know that their care uh, is increasing. Their care needs are increasing. And within a, you know, relatively, let's say within the two and a half year look back period, they're probably going to need some sort of care at home. And we're going to want to look towards Medicaid to pay for that care because care at home is extremely expensive. That's who I'm directing this presentation towards. So... What are we doing now, uh, you know, prior to October 1st? Well, we're, we're receiving a lot of phone calls from families that are saying just exactly this. They're saying, look, uh, Sal, I, 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 want to, I want to transfer my assets before October 1st. That way I'm not subjected to this two and a half year look back period. Or I'm calling on behalf of my mom or my dad. I'm the power of attorney. And as the power of attorney, I want you to tell me, Sal, what I can do before October 1st so that way we don't get caught in this new law. And we're getting a lot of those phone calls. And September is going to be a very busy month for us uh, because there's a lot of people that are going to be transferring assets. So the technique that we use on a regular basis to protect people's assets is, is the Medicaid trust. And we're going to be drafting quite a bit of Medicaid trust most likely in the month of September 
as a mechanism to move assets out of people's names so that way we can get past not only the two and a half year look back period, but also the five year look back period for nursing home care, right? So we can't forget that there's a five year look back period for nursing home purposes. So most people would come in, they would do the Medicaid trust, largely because they were worried about nursing home care someday. But now you've got to come in and you've got to do the Medicaid trust because you might need home care someday. So I want to spend some time talking about a couple of things. I want to talk about what does the Medicaid trust look like? What are the ins and outs of the Medicaid trust? And then I want to talk to you about why you should be considering a Medicaid trust. Some people might say, Sal, why can't I just give my assets to my kids? Well, I'm going to go through some of those, those topics with you. Let's talk about the Medicaid trust first. It's a wonderful technique. It's, a, it's something that an elder law attorney uses on a regular basis, and it really works, works well if it's done correctly. And I, and I want to be very clear about that. Uh, just this last week, I had the opportunity to review in, on two separate occasions in one week, Medicaid trusts that were drafted by non-elder law attorneys. In one case, it was, it was a non-elder law attorney, and in another case, it was uh, an attorney purporting to practice in the area of elder law on a regular basis, and, and, and the trust as drafted was deficient in many ways. So I want you to be careful. It, it doesn't have to be me. I, I would love to work with everybody. But if you feel that, that, that for some reason it's not me, just make sure you work with an elder law attorney. Make sure you research that person. Go onto their website. See what their credentials are. You should know that you're working with an elder law attorney by visiting their website. Uh, don't just take a blind recommendation. This is an area of law where if you make a mistake, it's not, it's not easy to fix. For instance, in, in, in one of the instances this week, I don't have an answer for the family. Uh, there, was a, there, there was an omission in the trust that was drafted, and I don't, I don't have an answer. You know, and I'm an experienced elder law attorney, and, and I, I can't fix what was done. So I want you to be careful about that. We've spent many years drafting these trusts. Uh, it's almost like a work of art, right? You know, uh, a painter spends a lot of time on a painting and touches it up here, touches it up there. Well, that's what a, an attorney does with his or her documents, we spend a lot of time on our documents. We change them all the time. We might learn something new. Uh, we make additions. We, we, we delete things that we thought you know, were, 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 you know, were good at one point, and now we don't like the way they, they read, or maybe there's a better way of doing it. So we're always changing our documents. But the Medicaid trust, a lot of people set the Medicaid trust up for their house. You can put other assets into the Medicaid trust, like brokerage account assets or cash, uh, and I've got plenty of clients that do that, and especially in the month of September, a lot of people might be considering that. We've got a couple of those going on right now, but a lot of people do it for their house. So what does the Medicaid trust look like? Well, let's see. You're the creator of the trust, right? So you're forming the trust. You're, that, that's, you, know, you can walk around calling yourself the creator, and you can feel special and important. The trustee of the trust is usually a child or maybe a friend or another relative, it's not going to be you. We don't, at least in this office, we don't draft these Medicaid trusts where you're the trustee. The trick with these Medicaid trusts is to give you enough power and control without crossing the line that would cause the trust to be viewed by Medicaid as an available resource. So we're not comfortable, and most of my colleagues feel the same way, we're not comfortable putting you in as trustee. Now, the trust provides that if there's a house in the trust, you have the right to live in the house for the rest of your life. With that, you have, well, you're responsible for paying the upkeep and the maintenance on the house, the real estate taxes, uh, to the extent that you're allowed to get a deduction for real estate taxes. By the way, I'm an accountant. I don't, I don't know if you guys know that, but uh, I'm an accountant as well as an elder law attorney. So you can continue to receive a real estate deduction on your tax return. Uh, and those are all the traditional benefits that you get as a homeowner, right? We also get the STAR exemption. Nothing changes with the STAR exemption. You most likely have to reapply for the STAR exemption, right? The, star, the, the rules for the STAR exemption changed a few years back. So we tell our clients, make sure you, you reapply for the STAR exemption, but you still get the STAR exemption. You still get the, uh, the veteran's exemption if you're getting that. So nothing changes from that perspective. A lot of people say to me, well, Sal, what if I want to sell my house someday? Well, that's no problem. 
the trustee, let's say it's your daughter. Your daughter, as the trustee of the trust, is the person that sells the house. She's the one that would sign the contract of sale. She's the one that would attend to the closing. And you can sell your house very easily and you can and she can purchase a new house. So let's say you're somebody that wants to downsize. If you want to downsize, uh, she would sell your, your, your primary residence and she would buy something else and then you've downsized. Some people might say, Sal, if I downsize, what happens to the cash? What happens to the cash that's left? Well, that stays in the trust, right? That stays in the trust. So you might, let's say you have a house that might be worth, uh, I don't know, $500,000 and you want to downsize to uh, a, a co-op, which by the way, I think I'm going to repurpose one of my articles on co-ops. Uh, co-ops, you got to be very careful with. There are a lot of rules and restrictions. And one of the big ones is a lot of co-ops might not allow you to transfer your shares of the co-op into a trust. So before you downsize to a co-op, you want to see what the rules and the regulations are for the co-op. But let's say you sold the house for 500 and you bought a co-op for 200,000. There's $300,000 left over. That money's gonna stay in the trust. And the trustee, maybe it's your daughter like we just talked about, she can invest that money for you. And another mechanism of the trust is that the income is payable back to you. So let's say she invests the $300,000 and it generates, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, make it up, you know, $15,000 a year in interest and dividends. That money comes back to you the way we draft these trusts. So that's an important aspect for people that want to put liquidity into the trust. If you want to put brokerage accounts, if you want to put cash into the trust, know that you're entitled to receive the income back from the trust. That's important. Big mistake that people make, my, I've had even my own clients after sitting with me and I educate them and I just got a call from a very good client of mine a couple, couple of months ago. He sold his house and uh, the real estate attorney wrote the check out to my client individually. We don't want that, right? The trustee is the one that owns the house for, ta for, for, for legal purposes, not for tax purposes. For tax purposes, you as the creator own the trust. But legally, the trustee is the owner of the property. So if you sell the house, the check has got to go to, uh, you know, Mrs. Kelly as trustee of the trust. Then she puts it into the brokerage account or the checking account that's in the trust, and it stays in the trust. It doesn't come out of the trust. The fundamental tenant of these Medicaid trusts is very important. If you take the money out of the trust, you blew the trust out of the water. You busted the trust. You're not allowed to have access to the principle of the trust. Now, don't get scared. We're going to talk about a few bells and whistles that we put into the trust that indirectly get you access to the trust. So don't shut it down because you don't have access directly to the trust. But make no mistake. If I put $500,000 into the Medicaid trust, I get the income from that $500,000. But I can't just ask my daughter to write me out a check for $20,000 because I want to buy a car. You know, one of the things that needs to be done when you set up these trusts and you're trying to determine which assets to put into the trust is you should really be working with a financial planner or a financial advisor. We want to take a, 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 a holistic approach. We want to look at your, your entire financial picture. Generally speaking, the house goes in the trust because you don't need to touch and feel the house. It's not liquid. As long as you have the right to live there, if, as long as you can put the key in the door at nighttime and it works, and you can go to sleep in your own bed. Uh, that's all you care about as far as the house goes, along with the star exemption, the veterans exemption. But as far as money goes, you don't want to put money into the, into the trust that you might need someday. So you, let's say you have $500,000. We might sit with you and your financial advisor and we might do a, you know, a cash flow analysis. What does your income look like? Are you getting social security? Are you getting a pension? Are you, you have IRA benefits? What does that all look like? How have I been living? Can I pay my expenses? Does everything work out? If you're in the positive every month, we could be a little bit more aggressive with the assets that we put into the trust. If you're telling me that every month you take an extra thousand dollars out of your, your savings account or your brokerage account, well, we want to back off a little bit. I tell people all the time, pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. A good elder law plan does not protect all of your assets. Remember that. That's an important aspect of what we do. 
Anybody that tells you to take all of your assets and put them away in a trust, I think should really check what they're telling you. We never tell everybody to put everything they have into the trust. It's always a, a portion of your assets. If we could save your house and a portion of your liquidity, most people are happy, especially considering the cost of long-term care. Long-term care is $15,000 a month in a nursing home. You could spend $10,000 a month at, at home for an aid in a home care scenario. So people are glad to be able to save the house and some of their, their, their assets, even if that means that the assets that we kept in your name have to be spent on your care someday. Very, very important. So let's talk about some of those bells and whistles in the Medicaid trust. So I told you that you're the creator. I told you who the trustee is. I told you you can get the income from the trust. I told you you cannot have access to the principal of the trust. One of the things that I put into my trust, uh, and these are things that you, you probably, I don't know if you'll see them in other attorneys' documents, and maybe if they listen to this, you'll start to see them. Uh, I provide that the trustee cannot sell the house without your consent. So I think that's a, that's a, a you know a meaningful you know mechanism to make sure that somebody doesn't kick you out of your house someday. Uh, a lot of attorneys do this. We put uh, something called a sprinkling power into the trust. This is how you can actually get access to the money, uh, you know, indirectly. We'll draft the trust so that way, principal can be distributed to your children or any other class of beneficiaries that we might determine, you know, is appropriate. So if we have that provision in the trust and something comes up where you need assets, your daughter can distribute those assets to herself or to another sibling, if there is, and then that becomes their money, right? And then once it's their money, they could do whatever they want with that money. They can, they can give it back to you, which might not be the right thing to do, but they can pay something on your behalf. Uh, they can pay for, uh, let's say you have to renovate your house. There could be a whole host of things that need to be done. So that's how we can actually get assets out of the trust. Useful mechanism. Um, one of the things that we have to draft in these trusts, and this is something that we see it's being missed often. This is one of those techniques that when I review other attorneys' trusts, it's not there. We have to have mechanisms in the trust that actually allow us to revoke the trust. This is an irrevocable trust. So generally speaking, you can't change it. But under New York state law, there's a way to actually revoke an irrevocable trust. So for those of you that are nervous because you're giving up control, right? I, and, and, and I'm probably not going to miss any of your, your worries because I've heard this a million times. Sal, I don't want to give up control. It's my house. I, I built this house. I paid the bills on this house. I paid the mortgage. I don't want to give this away. I don't want to be kicked out of my house. Well, I told you that can't happen. I don't want to give up control of my assets. Well, I told you that there's a way to get the assets out of the trust if you trust your kids. Well, what happens if something happens to one of my kids and I don't get along with them? We actually give you the power to remove and replace your trustee. So it very well could be that your, your son or your daughter, you lose your relationship for whatever reason. We give you the power to remove and replace the trustee at any time. You can remove anybody and put me, you can put me in if you, if you needed to, right? You can put your accountant in, you can put your financial advisor, whoever you want. These are all mechanisms that we, we use in the drafting of our trust that should give you a certain degree of comfort, that you're not giving up total control. And finally, there's a, a way to revoke an irrevocable trust under New York state law. You need to get the consent of all the beneficiaries. The trick is New York state law or case law says that the beneficiaries are not only your children, because that's usually what the trust would say, but it could be your grandchildren if, you're, if, if you have grandchildren. And if, though, if you have minor grandchildren, we need their consent. And clearly we cannot get the consent of minor grandchildren. So this is a very important power that we put into the trust. We give you the power to change the beneficiaries of the trust. Why is that important? Well, right here, if I need to revoke the trust for some reason, let's say we set this trust up and you get sick within the two and a half year look back period, or let's say you get sick in the five year look back period. We've got to revoke the trust. 
We've got to revoke the trust, put everything back to the way it was to get you out of the penalty period. I've, I've, I've done a video on this. Go on my website. You can, you can view it. But we've got to reverse that penalty period. I need to be able to revoke this trust. In order to revoke it, I need the consent of the beneficiaries. I've got minors. I can't get their consent. So I have to exercise the power that I've drafted in the trust to change the beneficiaries of the trust. I'll change the beneficiaries to your adult children. Then I'll get their consent to revoke the trust. And then I'll revoke the trust. If that power is not in the trust, the trust is deficient. You're not going to be able to revoke it. And that's a really big problem that we see today when trusts are being drafted by attorneys that are not proficient in this area. There's no way to really fix that. Uh, it's a really big problem. So I want you to be mindful of that. So these are all different aspects of the Medicaid trust that cause it to be probably the most important planning technique that we implement on a regular basis. It gives up a certain degree of control so that way if you get past the five-year look-back period or the two-and-a-half-year look-back period, the assets of the trust are not considered to be resources for Medicaid eligibility purposes. That's the name of the game over here. But in doing so, you've got to give up some degree of control. You want to be able to do it in such a way where you have all those bells and whistles that I talked about and still have the opportunity to receive any income from the trust, be able to live in the property, be able to sell the property of the trust. And in most cases, you know, people might be a little concerned when they set these up because it's, you know, it's a little, a little fearful, you know, parting with your assets. But you'll see that nothing much changes as we go on. Uh, some of the other aspects of the trust. We'll get a tax ID number for the trust. Uh, some attorneys don't get a tax ID number. That's a discussion for another day, but we do. Uh, if there's income being generated by the trust, you'll have to file a tax return. Again, that's a discussion for another day. It's not a complicated tax return, but if you're not familiar with fiduciary tax returns, it, it's, it's complicated. Uh, those are two things that, 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 that a lot of people are not aware of. When we set up these trusts and you put the house into the trust, uh, we tell you to contact your insurance company, your homeowner's insurance. Let them know that you did this. We don't want to run into a situation where we don't have an insurable interest. Some insurance companies put a rider. Some insurance companies draft a new policy. There's all different ways of doing it. Uh, it depends on what insurance company you're working with. So this Medicaid trust is is is. The, one of the preeminent planning techniques in an elder law attorney's practice. We've been drafting them for many, many years. We draft a lot of them on a regular, everyday basis. It's one of the few planning techniques that you can implement in advance of needing care. You do it in advance. Most of my clients start out in their 60s, and I've done it all the way up into, you know, I'm not sure I've done it for anybody in their 90s. I think maybe a few here or there, uh, because there's really no downside. If the trust is drafted properly, and mine is, and, and again, I'm harping on this, but if the trust is pr drafted properly, we can revoke it any time. So you're, you're not out anything other than legal fees. So it's really worth taking a shot regardless of what your age is. You want to do it earlier, sooner rather than later, uh, but, you know, it's never, you know, very rarely do I say it's a lost cause. Now, October 1st, why are we doing these for people prior to October 1st. Well, again, we think that some people might need care within the next two and a half years. And if we get the trust set up and we get assets transferred to the trust, we beat the two and a half year look back period. That's the, 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 the name of the game right now. Some people are saying to me, well, Sal, why not? Why can't I just transfer my house to my kids? Well, I, I think I did a video on that. I definitely wrote an article on that. That's on my website. You, you rarely, rarely want to take your house and just transfer it out of your name to your kids. There are adverse tax consequences to doing that, uh, and that's, that's the big deal. Uh, but then you really don't own it. Then you, don't, you lose your star exemption, you lose your, your veteran's exemption, you lose any right to take real estate tax deductions. Transferring your house outright to your kids is one of the worst things that you can do. Uh, in some cases, we might do a life estate Life estates were something that we did many, you know, it's about, wow, it's about 15 years ago that the law changed, uh, 2005. 
so you want to be careful about life estates. Life estates are not the preeminent vehicle on a regular basis these days. Why do we not just take the money and give it to the kids? Well, you heard me before talking about how I might have to reverse course. If somebody gets sick within the two and a half year look back period or within the five year look back period, we've got to reverse course. What if I've taken your assets and I give them to a child of yours and that child doesn't want to give me back the assets or that child has spent the assets or that child gets divorced or that child has a, 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 a creditor issues, maybe a lawsuit or judgment against him or her. There's a whole, or what if the child, God forbid, dies? I've had that happen in my practice. Those are five instances right there that are going to prohibit me from getting the assets back so that way I can reverse course. And the result of not being able to reverse course is, is that you're going to be locked into a penalty period for Medicaid eligibility purposes, which means that you've got to privately pay for the nursing home or for your home care. So rarely do we transfer assets outright to children. Just last week, somebody called me up and wanted to do a Medicaid trust, but she was an only child. And I said to her, I said, look, I, there's really no reason for you to spend money with me to draft this trust. You know, let's, uh, you know, let's transfer the money directly to you. You, you know what the story is. I've, I've properly educated you. Yes, I'm taking a risk that, God forbid, you might die and, and you might get divorced. But we really don't think those are, you know, issues to, to be mindful of with this particular client. So we, we just transfer the money to her. We also want to be able to use the trust because there might be multiple beneficiaries. What if you have five kids? What if you have three kids? What if you have two kids? Who do you choose? Who do you transfer your assets to? You know, that's difficult. So we don't want to be in a position where we're transferring assets to one and then telling that child that they have to take care of their other siblings after you die. That's not the way it works. That's back of the envelope estate planning. So using a Medicaid trust is really good to make sure that your assets get divided equally among your, your heirs upon your death. So these are all good reasons to use a Medicaid trust. The Medicaid trust, like I said, is a powerful you know, planning technique. And if you think you're somebody that might need care in the next two and a half years, or you know somebody that needs care in the next two and a half years, you really have to jump on this now uh, because the time, you know, the clock is, is ticking and uh, we only have one month left to really beat this look back period. So with that being said, I'm going to I'm going to end this for now. Uh, I don't think there are any questions, but if you do have any questions, feel free to email me at smd at mfd hyphen law dot com. And I'll respond to any questions that you have. Call my office at 914-925-1010. Uh, Maddie will answer the phone. She's a wonderful person. Everybody loves her. She'll schedule a consultation if that's what you'd like to do. Uh, I'm happy to speak with anybody. We could do Zoom. We could do, you know, teleconference. And lastly, if you want to visit my website, Plan Today for Tomorrow, there's plenty of useful information on my website. Uh, if you like these, which I, I, I know a lot of people do, they're being viewed, uh, you know, by a lot of people. And I'm very, very impressed with that. And I thank everybody for viewing these. Uh, please share them with your friends. This is extremely useful information. I, I can't stress enough. A lot of people come to my office and they say, Sal, well, are you going to stay in touch with me? How am I going to know if something changes? Well, this is how I stay in touch with people. I do this. If you're on my, my newsletter, you'll get information from me on my newsletter. Um, there's only so many different ways that I can stay in touch with you. Uh, so please share this with people. If you think it's useful, uh, we can really save people a lot of money if they do their planning, uh, the right way. Uh, and so with that being said, have a healthy, happy, and safe, uh, remaining summer. We'll be back again in two weeks. Um, I'm not sure what the topic is just yet. Uh, we also are going to be looking to bring in some of our colleagues, to share some of their professional expertise. I think that's very useful for everybody. If there's anything you want me to speak about, it makes my life a lot easier if you just email me and ask me to speak about something. Uh, but we'll be back and uh, I'll see you then. Take care.